So I think we should make a start. Um, uh, I'm James Firebrace of the British Yemeni Society, uh, and I'd like to welcome a very warm welcome tonight for Professor Nancy Um, our speaker. Um, uh, well, for Nancy, of course, it's uh, early-ish morning because she's based in Los Angeles, I understand. So this is a joint event between BYS, British Yemeni Society, EASA, the International Association for the Study of Arabia, and the MBI Al Jaba Foundation. Uh, Nancy will be talking to us about the coffee trade for Mocha in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, and possibly, possibly in the Q&A, add further insights from her more recent research into uh, porcelain finds from shipwrecks, which I think is a, a fascinating subject in itself. Uh, Nancy Um is currently Associate Director for Research and Knowledge Creation at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. From 2001 to 2022, she was a faculty member in the Department of Art History at Binghamton University in New York. So at some point earlier this year, she crossed the continent from one coast to the other. Her research focuses on trade and cross-cultural exchange in the early modern era. So she explores the Islamic world from the perspective of the coast, examining the material, visual and built culture of the Arabian Peninsula, and in particular around two of its rims, the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. She's author of no less than two books, specifically about Yemen's age of coffee. Uh, the first one in 2009, uh, here it is. Um, uh, the Merchant Houses of Mocha, Trade and Architecture in an Indian Ocean Port. Uh, and then another one uh, a few years later, Shipped but Not Sold, Material Culture and the Social Protocols of Trade during Yemen's Age of Coffee. In addition, she's researched and written extensively about trade, art, diplomacy, gift exchange around the modern Indian Ocean Rim. So we're very privileged that Professor Om has been able to join us tonight. Uh, just a few points about this meeting. It will be recorded uh, and subsequently made, made available on the BYS website. The Q&A section of the evening will be managed by Dr. Noel Briani, Chairman of EASA and former Chair of BYS. Please post your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the chat box itself will be closed. And I think we'll aim to finish this meeting at around 7.15. Let's play it a bit by ear. But that's uh, that's our target. Over to you now, Nancy. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think I will uh, start by sharing my screen. Okay, does that look okay to you on your end? Yes. All right. Great, thank you. So hello everyone, good evening to my colleagues in the UK. As you heard, I am in Los Angeles right now where it is still morning and I've recently moved to California. I am struck by how much more difficult it happens to be to log on to virtual events that are taking place across the Atlantic from the West Coast of the US. So I'm very pleased today to be able to make this connection even with the added distance between us. And along those lines, I'd like to thank Noel Brahoni for offering the generous invitation to speak and James Firebrace for kindly introducing this talk, in addition to Ibrahim Zanta for making all of the arrangements. I'm grateful to the British Yemeni Society for hosting me and to its partners, the International Association for the Study of Arabia and the MBI Al Jabr Foundation as well. So I will begin today's talk with a bit of a caveat. So Noel asked me to speak on the topic of mocha and the Yemen coffee trade now many months ago. I think it may have even been about a year ago. And at that time, I told him that I was uh, very happy to speak and to address this audience, but that I had ceased to work on those particular topics. So I offered to present on some of my newer work, which is oriented more broadly around Indian Ocean material culture. Several conversations ensued, and it seemed to me to be clear that the greatest interest was still on mocha and on coffee. So uh, uh, I decided to move in that direction, and Noel has ensured me that there is still interest in these topics and that it would be worth revisiting. 
So to that end, today's talk will be quite reflective about mocha and the coffee trade, drawing on work that I conducted for my book, um, The Merchant Houses of Mocha, that now was published over a decade ago. So I'll be kind of looking back to that work, but I will be trying to inflect this, this discussion with a sense of what has changed over really what's been almost 30 years actually that I've been working on this topic. And indeed, one of the most interesting developments has been that the study of mocha the study of the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, all of these areas have become a much livelier place in recent years. And indeed, um, I think there's been a lot of new work and new perspectives on all of these topics that um, are worth very much taking into consideration. So let's just begin with a little bit of background because I'm aware that not everyone might be as um, familiar with the topic of mocha and the coffee trade. So I'll just start with some uh, geographical information. As you can see here on the map, Mocha is a port city located on the southern Red Sea coast of Yemen, and it appears with a little yellow dot on the uh, lower right, uh, left-hand corner, excuse me, of this map. Locally, it is known as Al-Maha or al Mocha, and it was a city that is actually fairly late, let's say, in Yemen's very long history. It was developed as a major port of trade by the Ottomans in the 16th century. And the Ottomans had two periods of rule in Yemen, the first beginning in the year 1538 and ending in the year 1636, and the second one beginning in the 19th century and ending in the 20th. Um, and so when they arrived in Yemen, they really cultivated mocha, they developed its infrastructure as a major port. When they were uh, ousted from Yemen by the Qasimi Imams of Yemen, a Zaidi family from the north, uh, the Qasimis continued to use mocha as the major site of their trade. Um, and indeed, mocha persisted until the 19th century as Yemen's, um, and definitely its most important port, port, until Aden was reinvigorated by the British in the 19th century. In terms of its connections, I think this map encapsulates most of the most important um, parts of the Mocha maritime network. The sister city of Mocha was the port of Surat in Gujarat in Northwest India that you see all the way on the right hand edge of this map. And indeed there was frequent traffic between those two cities. The major merchants of Surat occupied a very important place in Mocha. They sent ships yearly and they were all known by name, even if very few of them actually traveled to the port themselves. Mocha was also closely connected to other ports within the Red Sea. And you can see up to the north, the port of Jeddah, the major port of pilgrimage, the port to Mecca, which really served as a crux of this body of water. Also important are Mocha's connections across the Red Sea to the other side of that body of water, the African side of the body of water, with its connections to both Masawa and Beilul, which is directly across from Mocha, both located in modern day Eritrea. And as one more set of connections, I take you across the Arabian Peninsula to Matra, located in modern day Muscat in Oman, and Bandar Kung, which is on the uh, coast of Iran. Uh, both of those cities, again, were closely connected to Mocha, and we hear of merchants from those cities and their trade quite frequently. So you can see that Mocha sat at the nexus of long distance networks of trade, along with more regional ones. I should add that Mocha was very conveniently situated right inside the entry of the Red Sea, Bebel al Mandeb, the straits, um, that narrow opening that um, led to this body of water. And the Red Sea, of course, was quite treacherous to navigate because of its dangerous coral reefs and its unpredictable winds. And so one of the reasons why I think Mocha thrived was because the big ocean going vessels that came from the Indian Ocean would offload their goods there and then they could exit and go back into the Indian Ocean. They weren't obliged to navigate those difficult waters. They left that regional trade to the local vessels, the jilab or jilbas, um, that were smaller and easier to, um, to navigate within the Red Sea and were often piloted by more experienced seafarers in the region. And so these are some of the reasons why, or one of the reasons why I think Mocha thrived to that extent. 
So with that, but let me just say a few words about the work that I did on MOCA and where I began now almost three decades ago. And it is fitting now that I return back to Los Angeles because this is in fact where all of this started for me when I was a graduate student at UCLA working on my doctoral dissertation. And I still remember those very early days when I was trying to conceive of a topic to work on. And I was very interested in the Indian Ocean. And it struck me that very few art historians and architectural historians at that time were writing on the Indian Ocean world and very few working on the Red Sea as well. There were, of course, historians who had staked out the territory, such as the eminent Dutch historian, Case Brouwer. Some of you may be familiar with his work and some archeologists as well. So I saw a great opening there, and I believe that MOCA would serve as a very fertile research topic. And I was primarily interested in thinking about port city morphology, how coastal cities serve the vibrant and bustling cross-cultural trade that I just described to you, but also really how that architecture and the kind of functional aspects of the trade could be carried out in the space of a city like MOCA. All of this was a great idea as I was sitting at my desk um, use, with my big stack of you know, library books um, on the topic. But then of course, I finally went to MOCA and this is what I found. Um, and uh, this photograph here taken by the photographer, Lynn Davis, also taken in 1996, which was the first year that I visited Yemen and visited MOCA, uh, certainly uh, provides a picture of what I encountered. I must say that I was disappointed to learn that MOCA was no longer intact in a way that would allow for its study in situ. And of course, MOCA is still an inhabited city. I don't want to make it seem as if it's entirely deserted, but its historic fabric uh, was no longer legible. There were monuments on site and namely religious ones like the ones that you see here in this image and you can see particularly in the background the presence of tombs and a mosque that were still standing but um, indeed this image of this minaret teetering on this deteriorated base that you see here in the foreground in many ways has in many ways has become an icon of MOCA's current state. And I will say that there um, were at the time when I first visited in the 90s, houses that were still inhabited and um, some that merited exploration, but the large majority of the merchant houses of MOCA that I evoked in the title of my book were greatly destroyed. And so upon witnessing this quite ruined historic landscape, it became abundantly clear that my work would have to depend on sources other than the city itself. And in that regard, MOCA bears an extensive record of textual documentation. Um, and indeed, those international connections that I've just pointed to were very important. Um, and indeed, the majority of sources that most people who have written about the city have used are foreign. They're not exclusively foreign, but most of them come from outside of Yemen. And we are dealing with a uh, certainly a large number of travelers' records. And when I talked about the connections of MOCA just right now showing you that map, of course, I did not mention the many European merchants um, that, uh, travel, that traded at MOCA, and I will get into that now. And indeed, many of these merchants who came to MOCA left records, some of which were published. What I'm showing you here on the screen, just as perhaps the best known exemplar, um, is an image from the publication of Karsten Niebuhr who visited MOCA in the year 1763. And he, in fact, was one member of a scientific team that was sponsored by the King of Denmark, King Frederick. Um, and his particular record um, is one that we rely on a great deal. He had a strong knowledge of Arabic and even colloquial Yemeni Arabic. He was a relatively sensitive observer, and he's been an important source on Yemen, but moreover on MOCA, because he spent a great deal of time in that city. And I would say with Niebuhr, he has quite an interesting story because among the group of five people that he set out with on his expedition, he was the only one who survived. And in fact, um, as he continued his journey, he continued to lose members of his team. The first member who passed away, indeed passed away in Mocha and was buried in the European cemetery to the north of the city. When one looks at these travelers' records, however, it's clear that they are repetitive. 
indeed, these travelers read each other's uh, references and read each other's accounts. And we see a kind of lineage of reporting on the city. So one has to interpret them very closely to understand what drew from original observations and what was simply drawing from others' kinds of remarks. But these travelers' records were not and are not the most important sources on MOCA. I would argue that these are without question the copious records left by the East India companies. And indeed, in this regard, the most important are those that were left by the English East India Company and the Dutch East India Company, or VOC. These are records that are well known to historians. Again, I mentioned Case Brouwer, the Dutch historian. I would also uh, re refer to the uh, historian Kagan Chowdhury, who used these records for the English East India Company. But I will say that these historians who came before me were mainly interested in reading these sources as they were intended. They were primarily intended as economic records to document the trade activities of these various European groups. Um, and indeed, Brouwer and Chowdhury and others tended to follow the quantitative nature of these documents and to really mine them to understand the volume of trade and the costs of commodities. And they also tended to stick to these records as a representation of the particular company's activities. So during the 90s, indeed, we had lots of studies like about the Dutch Seaborne Empire, the Portuguese Seaborne Empire, the English East India Company, all really looking at them from particular national perspectives. And so coming onto the scene with this material, and as an art and architectural historians, historian, um, I really had to kind of take a very different approach to the study of MOCA. Indeed, um, I was captivated particularly by the kind of record that you're looking at here on this screen. And these were left by the VOC or the Dutch East India Company merchants. Um, and indeed, this particular type of document was called a dog register or a kind of diary, essentially. And and these diaries were unique in that they provided a day-by-day -day accounting of activities in the city, particularly in the first decades of the 18th century, when the Dutch and the English maintained continuous residence there. And they were interesting to me precisely because of the fact that these merchants were in many ways, quite bored. Mocha was a sleepy city, um, and there was not always a lot happening. And if you take a look at the uh, document on the screen, even if you do not read Dutch, you can see that the first entry all the way at the top says, Nitz gepassiert nothing happened. And below you can see again another entry about nothing happening, and below again near the bottom, another date in which they uh, declare that nothing happened. The reason why those days of nothingness were so important to me is because it was in those moments that they would sometimes then just observe things that were happening in the city. They would make remarks like, you know, there's a new building being constructed in the southern part of the city. The governor goes every day to inspect the brickwork. Or they would describe an altercation that took place in front of the merchant um, Abdel Ghafour's house and describe um, the space in front of that house and how it was being used for those particular uh, kinds of disputes. Um, and those kinds of records that describe how that city was used were absolutely essential to understanding the urban fabric of a city that had been quite destroyed. And so it was in the mundane, the everyday and the ordinary, the nothingness, in fact, of that city that indeed we begin to understand the urban life of a city like Mocha. And indeed that has been always my investment in those kind of mundane activities. As you are all listening to me, I'm sure that some of you are wondering about the pitfalls of writing the history of the city of Mocha from what is inevitably a European perspective. And absolutely, this is a huge challenge. Um, and I will say um, that this requires um, lots of balancing in using sources that were written by Europeans, not to center their activities at all, but in fact, treating them as observers 
rather than main actors. And I think what's really important to understand is that the European merchants of Mocha were the most copious record keepers of activities in the city. And this is why they are so valuable to historians, but they were never the most important merchants from an economic sense. Those merchants from Surat, from Gujarat that I just mentioned, they dominated the trade of the city, but their records, whatever records they kept, are no longer um, present and extant for us today. So when one looks at these European records, we always have to think about the relatively diminished role that they played actually in the trade of the city compared to those who were much more dominant. And I think another approach that one can take with these sources is to find salient intersections between sources that come from different places. Um, and indeed, uh, there are, I should add, of course, Arabic sources on Mocha. I don't want to make it seem like they don't exist. They're usually quite scant. They usually say very little about the city itself. Some of them come from the biographical dictionaries of Yemen, and they describe, for instance, people who were posted to Mocha in various positions, such as a scribe or the governor or the, um, uh, the chief of the, uh, uh, the police of the city, the uh, inspector of the bazaar, for instance, or the souk. Um, and uh, sometimes we hear about Mocha from the chronicles. And those chronicles, though, I should add, were almost inevitably written from the perspective of the highlands. And so there was always a gap in transmission and a mediation between the coast and the capital. And so one has to then kind of triangulate these sources. And let me give you an example of how one can do this. For instance, this map that you see here on the screen is taken from a publication written by someone named Pierre de Fontaine, um, and it recalls the 1737 French attack on Mocha. And um, in this year, the French had become exasperated because they believed that the governor of Mocha, whose name was Ahmed Khazandar, had violated the terms of their trade agreement and had really fleeced them for a great amount of funds that were not due to him. They became very frustrated with their lack of ability to negotiate with the local uh, government. And so they brought in a number of French warships that you can see depicted here in the harbor of the city of Mocha. Um, those warships fired on the city and brought the govern government of the city to negotiations and they were finally able to recoup some of their losses. This attack on the city was quite devastating in Mocha. The French uh, published this uh, uh, account that you can see here as a kind of triumphal narrative of their successes in this regard. But at the same time, the Dutch were sitting in the city. They were watching all of this happening. And of course, while they were very interested to see how the French were going to be able to negotiate, they were no friends of the Dutch. They in uh, indeed um, saw the French as their competitors. Um, and they wrote um, a, uh, an account um, from their perspective of you know, over 100 pages of that same attack, but from a very different perspective. And actually, indeed, not from the perspective of the warships in the harbor, but from the perspective of an inhabitant of the city. And at the same time, a Yemeni historian, Lutfullah Jahaf, wrote a very short account of the attack. He, of course, saw the French as the great villains and uh, very much reviled their efforts to uh, try to greedily seize these funds. Um, and indeed, this very short account that allows us to kind of look at this one perspective, excuse me, this one um, event in the city from three different perspectives and to weigh them against each other. And by doing so, we can try to mitigate this European and indeed Eurocentric perspective by taking to, into account various different points of view. But I would say even further, though, I am an art historian, as I've already pointed out. Um, and so one of the kinds of goals that I think is very important in thinking about urban history and urban studies is to look at the range of visual documentation of a city like Mocha. And indeed, I'm showing you here a map that was a very important um, survey of the city very early in its history that served as a basis for many later maps as well. And so these images as they are, have been extremely important in reconstructing the city of Mocha. Um, and it's not only maps, we have a very rich set of images um, that I believe really need to be brought back into the historic record. Um, and here on the screen, I'm showing you two examples. 
on the left, you're looking at a photograph by the French photographer Auguste Bartholdi, who you may know because he also designed the Statue of Liberty. And I think something that most people do not know is that before he designed the Statue of Liberty, he had in fact um, been working on a colossal female a statue that was meant to be installed at the Suez Canal. And as he was making those plans, he in fact vis visited the Middle East twice. And on the first visit, he also went to Yemen. And you can see that he took what are, I believe, the earliest photographs of Yemen from 1856. And he uh, uh, th these images include representations of the port of Mocha. And on the right, we have photographs left by Hermann Burkhardt, the German traveler who traveled all over the Middle East. Um, and he is quite famous for particularly providing ethnographic documentation of the Jewish community of Yemen, which he was greatly interested in. Um, he took over 2,000 photographs of his travels, and some of them were from Mocha, like the image that you see here on the screen. And indeed, this year, 1909, is an important one because right after he left Mocha, he and his companion were actually ambushed and killed in Mocha, or excuse me, outside of Mocha on the way to Sana'a. Um, and uh, this was, we believe, a case of mistaken identity, um, but uh, the photographs were then recovered and they are now all in the Ethnological Museum um, uh, that, uh, of Dalem um, in Berlin. Um, and indeed these two images really help uh, to fill our gaps in architectural knowledge, to understand an architectural culture that, as I've described, only exists in fragments today in the city. But I should add that the spectacular houses that you see represented here are also mirrored in other sites around the Red Sea, in sites like Massawa in Eritrea, Suwakin in Sudan, Yambo and Jeddah in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and al Lahaya and al Hodeida in Yemen as well. And these houses together have been collectively referred to as the Red Sea style. And it's been quite exciting to be able to um, capture the Red Sea style of Mocha, mostly through this kind of documentation in the absence of many salient standing examples. Um, and I should say that actually the house on the right, though, was still actually standing the ruins of it were standing when I arrived in the 90s, uh, actually between two of my visits there, that Raushan or projecting wooden window collapsed, um, you know, dur during that time, so right in 1996. And the house on the left, you can see that it's Raushan or projecting window is undergirded by these spectacular bird-shaped brackets, which I am certain were carved in Gujarat, sent over to Mocha, and installed in this house. We will probably never know who the owner of this house was on the left, but I um, presume and I suspect that it may have been one of our Gujarati merchants of Mocha that I've already referred to. And just to give you a few more of these images, which I think are so important, I'm showing you here the palace of Sultan Hassan that was built in the early 19th century and that is now destroyed. This was also taken by Burkhardt in 1909. Um, and this image to me is really quite special, not only because it represents a building that no longer stands and quite a colossal one, as you can see, um, but I had the opportunity to show this photograph to Adil Abdul Waheb, whose grandfather was a putative historian of Mocha, who was quite elderly when I visited the city. And so his grandfather, uh, Adil's grandfather, wrote a short manuscript on the history of the city um, that I was able to consult in my study. Um, and Adil um, had heard about the palace of Sultan Hassan, you know, through his whole life. And he had seen little mounds of bricks left over from its foundation in the city. Um, and it had been identified to him by his grandfather, but he had never seen a photograph of the structure. And so it was wonderful to be able to show this to him and to kind of use it as an intermediary that kind of intersected his memories of the city that were largely recounted through oral history and through his grandfather's own recollections. And my study of the city, which was kind of you know, academic and you know, textual and, and you know, archival in this way. Um, and I really think that this kind of work of the historian who um, uh, kind of tries to bring together all these different kinds of memories is really an important part of this um, labor that we don't often um, identify. And so this image is really quite special for me for that reason as well. 
And I do want to just bring you one more of Burkhardt's image um, because I was quite thrilled in the archives to be able to find this photograph of the mosque of Sayyida Zainab, um, which I think is the only photograph that actually shows us that famous teetering minaret that you see on the right when it was part of a standing building and structurally intact. And so, you know, being able to make these connections, I think, was one of the great pleasures of this work. And I should add, however, that um, this image from 1996 also should be amended. In more recent years, uh, the residents of Mocha have created a uh, kind of concrete block uh, base uh, around the, um, the deteriorated structure of the minaret. And so it is now hopefully going to last into perpetuity in Mocha's urban form. So what I'm really trying to say here is that, um, you know, the study of Mocha for me is not only about this important port city, it's not only about coffee that I will get into in a moment, but it really is about this question of how we write port city histories, what kind of sources we use and how we weigh them. And indeed, in many ways, this focus on the visual is a response to much of the kind of textual focus that has come before me and before my work. And I hope that that kind of thinking about these various kinds of sources will be the contribution of this work. Now let's get into the question of coffee, which is, I imagine, why many of you are here. And I'll just start by saying that indeed, multiple legacies of coffee center around the city of Mocha. Many of these legacies also center around a particular historic figure, the Sufi mystic Sheikh Ali ibn Omar al-Shadili. And he lived in Mocha in the early 15th century. And so if we put this all together with a timeline that I've already delivered for you, you will probably understand that this figure, Ashadili, came before the Ottomans arrived in Yemen and thus came before this port city became a bustling international settlement. Indeed, he came when the city was just um, a small fishing village, as it's often described. Um, Ishadli was not from Mocha. He was actually from Zabid, located to the north of Mocha, and he traveled around the wider region. He went to the Hejaz, to the north, to Jerusalem, to Cairo, to Abyssinia, and it is after that journey that he came back to Yemen and he settled in the port city of Mocha. He developed a reputation there as a uh, religious figure um, and as a spiritual guide, and he developed a large following. He built a, a zawiya there or a Sufi lodge. He ended up dying in the city of Mocha, and he is still today considered to be its patron saint. Ashadali is famous um, because he has been attributed the singular status as the world's first coffee drinker, as truly the originator of this social habit. And I will say he is not uncontested in this role. Others have uh, attested that different Sufis from Yemen and different Sufis from other parts of the um, uh, of the Arab world were uh, actually were the uh, originators of coffee drinking. But I will say I think that Ashadali's name is mentioned most frequently in this regard. And if you are to refer to any popular sources about coffee drinking, you will inevitably come across his name spelled in a var variety of different ways, but it's still the sh same figure. And I will say that as a historian, I don't think that we get much mileage out of trying to poke holes in origin myths, because indeed I know why origin myths are important, but I am obliged to tell you that this particular association between Ishadali and coffee drinking, or let's say particularly uh, the attrib attribution of him as the first coffee drinker, that is an attribution that is without question that was made posthumously, because we have a number of biographers who lived not not during his lifetime, but a few decades later, and not a single one of those biographers from Yemen mentioned coffee in relation to Ashadali, even while they extol his other accomplishments. So it's very clear to me that it was a much later association between Ashadali and coffee, and it happens, we see even in the 16th century, but I do believe that that connection was made to tie together the patron saint of the city of Mocha and a city that then becomes um, became later associated with coffee with that very addictive substance. 
And um, so for me, when I think about um, Shadley as a historic figure, I invoke him less because of coffee uh, and more because of his role in really defining this important city. As I described, his tomb was constructed in the early 15th century, soon after his death. It was, I believe, the first monumental building in that city. Um, and indeed, uh, this is long before it became a major port. Um, later on, the Nine Dome Mosque that you see there on the left, and by the way, I just to, to clarify, the tomb is on the right, again, dating from the early 15th century. Um, and the Nine Dome Mosque that you see on the left was added later. And the two together became landmarks in the heart of the city of Mocha. And I will say over time, the tomb was expanded and the mosque continued to also be refurbished. The minaret that you see there was added in the early 18th century. And indeed, these two buildings really defined Mocha through the generations, particularly the tomb, from its earliest moment before its rise as a major port, all the way through to its later decline in the 19th and 20th centuries. And they are both uh, together or were both together major signs of the legacy of the patron saint of the city. And that is why it is so absolutely devastating that the tomb of Ashadli was recently destroyed. And I don't have the exact date of its destruction. I assume it was in 2017 um, when coalition forces came into Mocha and, re -to and took the city from the Houthis. Um, but it was definitely by the year 2018 when the photograph on the left was taken that the tomb was absolutely um, uh, rendered into rubble. And I will say, that it is quite difficult for me lately to find out information about Mocha's recent state. The families that I was in connection with have since left the city, particularly during the disruptions, the early disruptions of the war. And so I cannot profess that I have close ties to Mokhawis as I used to. Um, and I really actually uh, will uh, call out to this audience, some of whom may have information that I don't have to um, maybe add on to this or to clarify something that um, I um, am not completely certain about. Um, but the uh, the journalist Asma Waji, who's um, name you see here, who took the photograph on the screen, um, describes that uh, the tomb of Ishadali was destroyed again after coalition forces retook the city of Mocha and after heavy fighting. Um, and it was clearly destroyed by those who were and are opposed to the veneration of shrines. Um, and she described that it might have been some Salafi, um, some Salafis who were among the coalition forces. I'm not certain about that. I will say that we know from other reports that many other buildings in Yemen have been destroyed by AQAP or Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula, um, usually at moments when there was a great deal of chaos during the fighting. And so, for instance, um, the tomb of Asudi in Taz um, was destroyed by um, Ansar Sharia, a um, affiliate of AQAP. There were uh, two other um, or several other non-Muslim sites in Aden, uh, including a Hindu temple and uh, churches that also were believed to be damaged or um, uh, damaged by um, uh, Ansar Sharia. And so I just wanted to kind of put that out there. And again, I don't really know. I would be very grateful for more information. But what I do know, and simply just looking at the photograph on the left, you can see the rubble in front was the tomb. And you can see that the mosque behind it, of course, is not in pristine condition. You can see that there's some damage, certainly from, um, uh, from probably from some of the uh, events of 2000, um, uh, from the beginning of the war. Um, but it's very clear that the building in front was quite uh, deliberately demolished, and the mosque behind it is relatively pristine. Um, and so I really just want to highlight this as one of the many, many casual of the devastating war in Yemen. Um, and um, to me, really to lose that structure in particular, which again, really bridged all the generations of the city is a huge loss. And now I just want to say a few more words about coffee, because I think one thing that is uh, was not you know, really clear to me when I began my work, but has become so much clearer to me now is to really understand this moment and the moment that I particularly write on in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. These moments in which there was a scramble for coffee in the markets of Yemen, um, and to really understand this moment as a transitional time in the global history of coffee. 
And so I just want to say that, of course, we know, and I hope I've been clear about this, that the drinking of coffee as a hot beverage emerged somewhere in the lowlands of Yemen in the early 15th century in Sufi circles. That we know. What I think is um, the question mark really is um, if we can attribute a single originator to it and if that originator is a Shadley. And I'm, for my part, I'll say no. But we do know that indeed coffee drinking emerged in this place at that time. We also know that coffee cultivation on a large scale also was developed in Yemen first. Coffee grew wild, or coffee arabica, I will say, grew wild in the mountains of Ethiopia. It, uh, the plants were brought over to Yemen at some point. We do not know exactly when, but it was in Yemen where coffee was cultivated on a large scale by the Ottomans in the late 16th century. And it was indeed from those decades that then coffee was furnished from Yemen to a world that was increasingly thirsty for it until the early decades of the 18th century. Because indeed, it is at that time when the Dutch, who had been experimenting with coffee for many decades, were finally able to harness the quality and the quantity of coffee that they were cultivating on the island of Java. And there's a really amazing moment in the Dutch Dog Register that I've already referred to when the governor of Mocha calls in the Dutch resident and says, you know, so what's this I hear about seven ships full of coffee that were not acquired from Yemen that went from Asia all the way to Europe? And this is the moment in which this understanding of these new sites of coffee cultivation certainly uh, was, were, were um, understood, I would say, in Yemen. Um, and we uh, don't only have Dutch activities, but we, of course, also have French activities on Ile de Bourbon, the island of Réunion um, in the Indian Ocean, and the island of Martinique in the Caribbean, um, where coffee cultivation also ramps up in the 1720s. And indeed, by the 1730s, we have the quite extraordinary reversal of historic global trade trends with coffee, in that coffee that is cultivated in a place like Martinique is now moving from west to east into the ports of Egypt, the Levant and Anatolia via Marseille. Um, and we see that those movements of coffee that were so dominated by Yemen moving largely from east to west become uh, irreversibly changed and transformed, leading us into the kind of condition we have today in which coffee is truly a global product. Um, and indeed, Yemen came to play an increasingly small role in that industry. Although, as I'm sure many of you know today, there's a great interest in reviving the Yemeni coffee market. We could talk about that as well. Um, and it, indeed, uh, it may um, uh, let's say, regain um, a, a larger share of that trade that was originally so localized in the region. I mean, now I just want to say a few words about, you know, what there is to do today with Mocha as we move forward. And I've already described how challenging it has been for me to go back and do field work there. Obviously, um, you know, there are, uh, I mean, the war in, in Yemen has been so devastating. Um, I don't want to focus on, you know, my own research as something important there, but I have had to just ask, you know, what what is what can one do when that kind of career of architectural work that I had started many years ago um, is, you know, kind of no longer possible. I will say that I found that the study of material culture has been particularly interesting and those sources that I've described to you are ones that have continued to yield new findings and um, uh, and have been quite exciting in many ways and so I'm just showing you here this nice little array of objects associated with coffee and coffee ceremonies from Yemen that Karsten Niebuhr, uh, uh, one of his companions, recorded. Um, and you know what these images I think are interesting um, on their own terms, but one can begin to try to piece them together. And I have started to kind of think about, you know, what coffee pots in Mocha in the 18th century might have looked like, right? And we have this nice example from the British Museum, as well as these cup holders that porcelain coffee cups would be placed in here um, uh, with some examples from the V&A. Rose water sprinklers, as uh, the distribution of aromatics always was, came with a serving of coffee. And you can see here another one from the VNA with a silver mount that might have been a type like a type that was used in Yemen. 
and indeed this fantastic incense burner that in fact um, is being, uh, being represented on the left. This was an incense burner that Niebuhr had actually acquired in Yemen in the mid 18th century and sent back um, and sits in the National Museum of Denmark today. Um, and um, I will say as well that I've continued to look at these images of the port city. Um, and uh, before I was telling you how I had kind of dived into these images as representations of buildings that had been lost. Um, today I'm thinking about these image, images much more as pictures, right? With the understanding that Adrian Matem here, this Dutch artist of the early 17th century, as well as this anonymous artist who represented the port of Mocha in this Gujarati manuscript from the late 17th century, neither of them ever visited the port. They clearly gleaned information about it from those who had, but I think that these port city representations are kind of images that represent the imagination of faraway ports as much as they can be used as documents of a city, and I've been trying to conceive of them as such. And so I hope that this uh, evening for you, morning for me, um, that I've given you a sense of what is possible in terms of the study of MOCA in its past, in its present, and what we hope will be its future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, that, for that great introduction to, uh, to, uh, to Mocha. I've been an admirer of Nancy's work since being asked to review her book, Ship But Not Soul, which is the follow-on from the one she's been talking about, which dealt with material culture and social protocols of trade during Yemen's age of coffee. Um, um, her lectures also, I think, followed one we organised last or earlier this year um, by uh, uh, Karina Apokovaya on uh, on the uh, way, way that uh, on Yemen's history from the, uh, the period of transitions through the Ottomans to the, to the Karsinas. But I was very struck in reading, rereading your, your, your book about how well organized the, the, the whole coffee trade was under the Karsinas. I thought it might be interesting to say, if you would mind, can you say a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate the interest in the work and I'm um, you know, thrilled to be able to um, address this group. And uh, I will say too, I, I, I did attend that talk by Ekaterina, um, who's doing great work on the Kosmi period. And in some ways, I wish that I had come after Ekaterina because you know, um, yes. when I was working, I felt like there was so little that had been written on the Kosmi period that I was doing a lot of piecing together of an understanding of, um, of Kosmi history that, uh, you know, that was you know kind of part of the challenge and so again we're in a very different place right now than we were you know definitely 20 30 years ago in really understanding these dimensions of Yemeni history but also indeed coastal history um and so yes I, I didn't get a chance to talk at all about um the kind of larger regional dimensions of the coffee trade and um you know a case Brower has also written about this and you know it was the Ottomans who I think were really the ones who uh who set things up in Yemen again I've talked about the Ottomans and um so when like Michel Toucheret has have written about the ways in which the Ottomans actively sponsored the coffee trade. They very much um, uh, uh, sponsored and, and, and facilitated coffee cultivation on a large scale in a way that was not possible in, say, Ethiopia, where the Ottomans were never able to really get beyond their kind of coastal holdings. They could never get into the mountains, right? Um, and so it started with the Ottomans, um, and the Qasimis, um continued to really sponsor the trade. Um, we know that there were there was more than one uh, coffee market, but the market of Beit al-Faki um, in lowland Yemen, a few days north of Mo was the major uh, coffee emporium that was used. Um, and, uh, you know, this was a really a, an amazingly bustling entrepot. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we hear a lot, and this is, again, one of the problems of the sources, we hear a lot about the Europeans and what they did there, their frustrations. We could talk about how much Europeans bought in the coffee market, you know, for every day, practically, of the early 18th century, and how much they paid for the coffee. It's quite amazing. But again, the the most important merchants were those who came from Jeddah, who were shipping largely for the markets of the Mediterranean, for the market of Cairo, further on to the Levant and to um, and to the uh, Anatolia. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was a, a major share of that market that's not as well documented as the European trade. Um, 
And of course, it was one that was fickle in that it was, you know, it depended on how much, how many beans would come down from the highlands, right? And so these beans would come down, brought by farmers. Um, we uh, often hear about, you know, locusts and, and um, you know, problems of drought and so forth that always hindered the trade. But one really interesting thing to think about is particularly for those Indian Ocean going vessels that came in, the monsoon season, the schedule of the winds was very different from the schedule of harvest, right? And so they were always trying to navigate navigate this, you know, these kind of inconveniences of timing, and it's really quite fascinating. Another thing to say about that market is it was a cash market, right? And so you brought in silver, big, big chests of silver, the amazing influx and infusion of silver that came with the trade, um, I think is something that I've been thinking about a, a lot lately in my recent work as well. So I hope that starts to answer that question. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, we got, uh, uh, James has asked, uh, could you talk a bit about why the trade declined? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I, I hope that I kind of laid that out there that we have, you know, the rise of these other sites of cultivation, right? And I mean, it, to me, it's quite extraordinary to think about Caribbean coffee arriving in the Eastern Mediterranean by the 1730s, right? And so we began to see that there's these new sources that come in. I will say that coffee from Yemen was always, um, and certainly in those early decades, understood to be superior to coffee from Java or from uh, coffee from Martinique as a two major or other sources, but at the same time, um, uh, at, at, at the same time, um, you know, uh, the, those those channels opened up and they became very fierce competitors to Yemeni coffee very early on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we start to have competition and that uh, that changed everything. Right. And um, uh, and it happened very quickly as well. Yeah, but it's, but it's essentially external events, not the, the, the word from internal events in Yemen itself. Oh, well, there were lots of internal events. I mean, the 18th Indeed. century is a tumultuous <laughs> time, right? Yeah, thank, thank you, Noel, trying to feed me some little lines so that I can say more about the Qasimis. And, and you know, it's particularly in the 18th century where, you know, the, the Qasimi... Um, the Qasimi imams were, you know, um, were, there were many succession disputes, right? Um, and so we have lots and lots of fighting in the highlands where, um, you know, things change. And um, someone like uh, Bernard Heichel writes about this really quite beautifully about how in the 18th century, this is when the Qasimi imams are no longer resolved on the ways in which they should adjudicate their succession, um, you, you know, in which they should adjudicate their um, uh, notions of uh, Zaidi leadership, right, and, and who should who should succeed um, each other. Um, and so we start seeing you know, lots and lots of uh, conflict arising between various families. Um, and this is just defined these early moments um, through the uh, through those early decades of the 18th century. And um, it's really quite amazing, actually, to to read about some of this through the Dutch documents who are getting these kind of interesting stories coming in from the highlands. They're always garbled and mangled. And everyone's name also is, is, you know, kind of mangled, every, you know, every, everyone is called Hamid, and you can't tell if it's, it's Hamid or Muhammad or Ahmed, and so it's really hard to hard to understand, but at the same time, you really get a sense of disruptions that took place in the market um, that made it really hard for those who are exporting coffee, um, and it made those other sites extremely attractive, so... So internal and external circumstances that led led to those yeah, that's, shifts. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Is there a historical relationship between, between in those centuries, between the port of Mocha and the coffee coming from the mountains of neighboring Ethiopia and East Africa, or was it a, a monopoly for exporting coffee from the regions of Yemen only? Yeah, so, no, so this is this is a very good question. So, um, you know, we hear, and so in my period, right, and I'll, I'll just really talk about the, 16, the the late 17th and the early 18th centuries, which is both the heyday of the Yemen coffee market, but also it's kind of imminent, uh, the moment of its imminent decline, right, as we've, I've already described. Um, and so you sometimes hear about sacks of coffee coming over from the Horn of Africa. And indeed, I mean, those ports were closely tied together, I will say, obviously, coffee was, an, you know, was being sent over as an export product, but we also have the, um, the case where, you know, every very frequently, you know, because those those ships were not as defined by some of the wind patterns as other ones were like the ones that were coming from India and the Gulf. Um, and so we hear about, you know, firewood being sent, sent over from the Horn of Africa, water, sheep, right? So you have like everyday necessities that are also being sent over. They're close and closely tied together. Um, and indeed, you hear about some coffee coming over, but it was never 
um, in the quantities, I mean, we're talking about, you know, huge quantities um, that were being exported from Yemen. And so this was really a drop in the bucket. Um, but uh, it is, you know, it's described particularly in Mocha. And I do want to also add that, um, you know, Mocha is often quite erroneously described as a coffee trading port. That really wasn't the case. Coffee was really bought and sold in the interior yes. um, during, the, during the Ottoman period, certainly in the mountains. And then during the Qasmi period, we certainly have Beit al-Faqi being the major site in which Yemeni coffee is being uh, bought and sold. Um, and Mocha, sometimes people would buy coffee in Mocha, um, and but they only did if they didn't have the, you know, the, the ability to go into the center, you would really, you would not get a good deal if you were going to buy your coffee and mocha, that's for sure. And you wouldn't get the quantities that you needed as well. So that really is a kind of, um, you know, a misunderstanding, I would say, of, of the, the city. And part of that comes from the fact that, of course, coffee came from all these sites, Haraz, Hema, um, uh, Usab, right, um, Rema. But um, it, when it got, you know, when it got exported largely by the Europeans, they would always label it as mocha coffee, right? And so it kind of obscured those diverse origins and this label again, really, of mocha coffee as one that the Europeans kind of made stick um, in a way that I think has kind of confused our understanding of how that trade took place. I've also found in your book, what it said to me was, as you mentioned, the Basel Fiki really has become the wholesale market. Then the market yes. uh, issue but, but bought there. But the way the whole thing was organized by, by, by the imam, uh, different uh, to the governors and what the governors did and how they became wealthy, and how the investment, uh, how investment in all parts of Yemen really sprang from it, that the, the governors themselves, when we're talking here, obviously, about buildings in, in Mocha, but I think it, it becomes clear that the the, the, the governors and those in, in, who made a lot of money from the, uh, the coffee trade were actually building elsewhere in their home cities in Yemen. So it had a, a much wider impact um, on, uh, on, on architecture in Yemen. Yeah, so, so the image that's kind of sitting behind me right now, my background, you know, the Palace of Sultan Hassan is like a great example of, you know, one of the very few that we can, you know, really even view in a historic photograph of a structure that really you know, in, in which you kind of see the wealth of that trade coming through in direct architectural form, right? But there are other examples, right, where you see um, some of these uh, past governors of Mocha or those who were clearly beneficiaries of that trade um, to, you know, who, uh, uh, ac across Yemen, right, mm -hmm. who were able to benefit from, from, from the trade. Uh, question here from... Uh, uh... Tom Hopes, a uh, British architect. Yeah. What were the buildings constructed of in the main? Was it mud brick? If so, is this okay. why they degenerated so quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I haven't talked at all about their construction, and so, um, so the houses of Mocha were built with a kind of basalt foundation. So you've got the the stone foundation, and they were built with baked brick, not mud brick. And this is really important, right? Because it's a, you know a, a regionally, um, particularly in the Tama, you see largely the use of mud brick, excuse me, baked brick rather than mud brick. Um, and then they were coated with um, these kind of lime layers, um, and they also, of course, used supporting wooden beams um, to uh, to stabilize, right? And this is um, what we see across the Red Sea. Although one thing we do not see in, in Mocha, which is very important, and that we see in other Red Sea cities is the use of coral rock. That is not something that we see in Mocha. But by the, when you go further up, so for instance, in al Luhaya, so that's kind of like, um, you know, you have Mocha and then you have al Hodeida north of that, and then al Luhaya to the north of that. Um, that's where we begin to see a very, very prolific use of of coral rock in Hodeida as well. It was largely baked brick. When you go across the other side, you know, in Masawa they were using, um, you know, again further north they were using uh, coral, and so it's consistent visually with um, the building techniques that we see in other parts of the Red Sea, but not necessarily structurally. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, both Yemenis and Ethiopians claim to discovered coffee as a drink, uh, yeah. and their own stories about how this happened. 
does the historical records throw any light on this or is it yeah yeah so so i mean this is what i understand and again it's you know this the, these kind of origin stories are ones that i think are very much intertwined with these origin myths and you know and as i've said before i think those origin myths are you know are really important and you know people put a lot of um, you know there's a lot of kind of legacy and certainly um you know uh kind of investment i would say in them cultural investment in them so i don't think it uh, makes good sense for you know historians to spend all our time trying to take the air out of those stories because they are, you know they are significant for many reasons um but uh, you know we know that in ethiopia coffee beans have had a very long history of use Right. Um, and uh, there's, you know, uh, records of coffee beans being used as a kind of medicinal paste, right, and being prepared in different ways. What I understand, and again, I'm sure there will be the others who will want to, um, you know, provide a different perspective on this, which I, again, like I said, I think there's space for lots of different perspectives on this question, is that as far as we are talking about a hot beverage brewed from coffee beans, that this seems to have taken place in Yemen rather than in Ethiopia. So even if Ethiopia, for obvious reasons, you know, uh, coffee, coffee Arabica grew wild in Ethiopia, and so it was used for many reasons, but that particular particular preparation as a hot drink is often attributed to, again, the lowlands of Yemen and is believed to have emerged in Sufi or mystic circles. Um, and of course, the reason that's often given is that in the dhikrs or the kind of Sufi rituals that would often take place at night, coffee would keep the adherence stimulated and alive, uh, kind of awake and engaged. And so the caffeinated properties were related to those particular activities. Um, so I think one can make a distinction between coffee as a product and coffee as a drink. And that is what I, the legacy that Yemen claims. Right. Yeah. Yes, and with, 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 and with, with a great deal of um, textual, I would say, support there, you know, although it's it's not completely resolved, but indeed, that's where we begin, we really begin to hear about it within the Yemeni context in the 15th century. I was interested, this is maybe a bit personally, I was interested in, in your reference in your book, at least to the Jeddah Gap, the, the Red Sea. Yes, trade, I, yes. At that time between those really trading from Mocha and, the, and that really Cairo-based trade, which involved more Hadeda and the, and the Haya uh, ports. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, so to, and, and you know, and of course, this has been described. I, you know, I, I love it when the geographers get involved and they really talk about the wind patterns and that indeed there is, you know, that there are topographical, geographical, environmental reasons why Jeddah served as this kind of crux. You know, and I, I use the word gap. I don't know if I would use that word again. I might call it, a, you know, like pivot or something like that. Right? Yeah. That probably is a better word. I'm not sure why no one edited me on that. You know, many years ago. But but I did want to really make the case that um, I think that what what happens and, and and you know and i i don't know if there are any ottomanists on this um in this room and if they are they might they they might have some different perspectives on this is i i think that sometimes there were kind of elisions in understanding the history of the red sea and mocha precisely because um you know there was a particular configuration of the red sea i think that worked when the whole sea was under the control of the ottomans you know it's often called the red sea is often called an ottoman lake in the 16th century into the early 17th century and i think that was a case in which we had a great deal of fluidity, right? And Jeddah was one stopping point um, toward Mocha. But after the um, Ottomans no longer hold Yemeni ports and were kind of, you know, so the kind of the southern you know, obviously, they held Masawa on and off. That was a kind of a difficult port for them to hold. Um, but I think that that kind of notion of the Red Sea as an Ottoman lake got very much disrupted. And so sometimes we see kind of carryovers of thinking in that way that to me were not relevant or not accurate for the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and so I really, I think, you know, in talking about Jeddah as a pivot, literally a, a geographical pivot and a commercial pivot, I really wanted to kind of give a sense of how things had changed during that particular moment. Um, and that kind of the view from Istanbul, I think, can be a little bit problematic is what, I, what I'll say, right? Because it, it, it's, um, it, it doesn't tell the full story and it's not historically relevant throughout, right? I think it goes uh, slightly irrelevant, but I was interested in because in your book Ship uh, but not Soul, but how the, the linkage between because uh, you talk a lot there about the presence and the relationship between the, the merchants in Mocha and the Imam and, and the way that they that, that, yeah. that, that they visited the Imam and almost took permission from him to to to, to do their trade and an exchange of gifts of horses and and um, uh, uh, other things which. 
which actually, of course, was what, which is the other side of this, is what the merchants were bringing in to Mocha from, from elsewhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, well, it's so interesting because, you know, when we think about the imams of Yemen and obviously we're thinking, um, you know, we're often kind of looking back to more recent history, thinking about the Hamid al-Din imams of the 20th century. Of course, there's this, you know, image of the imams as so isolated and kind of cut off from the world, right, which we know is not the case, right? I mean, there were these connections and this, you know, kind of notion of isolation was one that I think was, um, um, has been, needs to be nuanced even for the 20th century, but that kind of pushes us back into the 17th and 18th century centuries um, where, uh, you know, where we, we might be led to believe that they were relatively isolated. And what I found that was so fascinating is the extent to which the imams were writing daily, you know, very frequently with um, to the Europeans. They were very aware of what was happening in Mocha. There was lots of exchange. Um, the visits were less frequent, definitely, but the epistolary, the kind of letter, you know, the exchange of letters was very, was quite frequent. They're extremely detailed as well. And we really get a sense of um, uh, the imams of Sana'a and those before them as well. So starting with Imam al-Mahdi Muhammad, who was based in, in Al-Mawahib before the imams became based in Sana'a, of um, a, a very close connection and an awareness of um, these various European groups, and you know, I think I, I wrote about the doctors, right? All of the yeah, all of the European doctors who went up to see, went up to El Muahib and and to visit um, the Imam uh, Muhammad and Mahdi Muhammad. Um, and if you were to only read the Arabic chronicles you would get no picture of that, I will say. They don't talk about this at all. There's a few brief mentions of, you know, the hat wearers, <laughs> um, you know, in, in, in the port and the kind of trouble that they caused. Um, but we see something very different and very, I would say intimate in some ways um, when we get into those documents. Um, and uh, and it, it is quite, I think, an important perspective that has been, that would be lost without um, without those particular accounts. One from uh, uh, Ahmed Naji, a brilliant presentation. Uh, my question is about the links between Mocha and the Horn of Africa. To which extent did such links shape the social cultural patterns in Mocha and other cities in, in, in Yemen's coasts? Big yeah. question. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I did try to kind of allude to it that, there, you know, that, I mean, there was just constant traffic, right? And there was, there were everyday goods coming from the other side of the Red Sea. And that's really important to understand that this was not just a kind of sporadic trade that treated, you know, um, uh, commodities for export. I mean, this was the kind of livelihood of Mocha, right? That was, you know, that was very intertwined with that of the other side of the Red Sea. Um, and what's really interesting just to kind of add to that is that this was a moment too um, in in the late 17th into the early 18th century, where the Qasimis even used the island of Zela in modern day Somal Somalia as a prison. Right. And so they would actually exile, you know, and so it's very, very interesting. So you have this kind of site, you know, as this place where where they would, you know, send all the people that they didn't want to deal with <laughs> across to Zela. And so um, and so, you know, you really see this kind of very interesting relationship in which the Horn of Africa is kind of, you know, distant but interconnected um, in ways that I think have uh, become, you know, are still the case. Right. I mean, we, you know, the the connections between those two sides of the Red Sea, um, you know, many have written on that. And we have many interesting accounts of the kind of, um, uh, let's say, less regulated traffic between those two sides, um, which is alive and well. And lots of smuggling, of course, as well. But <laughs> that's a topic I'm not qualified to speak on. There's a question here from John White. I'm such a fan of your work. Thank you. He says, I'm interested in your fascinating description of products traveling um, slightly east to west and then west to east. In other words, the multi-directional dimensions of global trade with the ceramics and porcelain, which we touched upon towards the end, did coffee consumption practices and demand in Yemen and the region feed back into the production of ceramic vessels elsewhere? It's a really great, great question. It's one that I've been, you know, really consumed with lately. It's a, you know, multi, multi-dimensional question. I mean, one thing I do want to just just highlight is the um, the fact that of course there was local ceramics production in Yemen, um, and we know that the production of uh, heist wares, so you know heist in the Tahama, very close to to Mocha. Um, uh, uh, Ed Keel has done you know great work on this, where he's really described the development of heist earthenware ceramics as really a response to coffee, right, and to coffee, you know, and so that's that's a very local kind of production, but also at the same time we know that. Um, uh, imports of porcelain and coffee wares were also at the same time extremely 
extremely important. So, you know, I, I do want to say that it's like, you know, there's this notion that, you know, local wares can kind of replace imported wares, but no, they were kind of two parallel worlds. And when you look at the archaeology of Mocha, and I'm relying obviously on my colleagues who've done surveys there, um, the uh, a lot of those kind of coarse earthenwares that were made locally um, for coffee were used outside of the city walls. Um, you know, so people, you know, in more modest circumstances, I imagine, um, uh, some of them were used inside as well, but it's inside where we see lots of the porcelain wares, which we know were imported, that were coming on the ships that were, um, some of them were coming from, from Surat, some of them were coming from the Gulf, some of them were coming also, and this is where the Europeans come in all the way from Batavia, from, from Southeast Asia, brought by the Dutch, um, and they were transshipped from there, um, as well as we know, you know, other Europeans as well brought large numbers of porcelain. And so we have kind of different vectors of, por of let's say, ceramic production, because, you know, you have the local earthenwares, you have the porcelain that's coming in, these finer wares that are coming in from China. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was a very kind of lively intersection of both of imported wares coming in for um, coffee consumption and coffee going out. And of course, as I'm sure many of my colleagues in this room know that by the early 18th century, very, very, very little black coffee from beans was being consumed in Yemen. It was all kishar produced from the coffee husk. And, um, you know, I, I very much surmise and, you know, maybe someone else will know that this is, you know, uh, that, you know, people were smart and they knew they could get more to by shipping the beans <laughs> and they use this waste product locally. But again, um, I don't know if we could ever prove really exactly how kishar so developed that way. I would carry for a few more minutes and then I think we have to give you a rest because you're, you're having to talk rather a lot. <laughs> uh, 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 from Shadi Kabati, thank you for, for the fascinating uh, talk. Uh, do you see any changes in the prevalence of coffee trade in Mocha uh, after the first period of Ottoman rule? Why doesn't come? Why doesn't come back in the second period yeah, uh, after yeah, the Ottoman turn in the um, mid nineteenth century? Yeah, it's it's a, a great question. And, you know, after the Ottomans were really kind of pushed out of Yemen, literally, right, by the Qasimis in the early 17th century, um, they always wanted to get back to Yemen. And they knew, you know, coffee was a main reason, right? And so we know that there were these kind of desires to come back to Yemen through the 17th century. And then in the early 18th century, I think they realized that they were never going to, they were not going to control Yemen again. Um, but I, and I, I've written about this, if anyone would like the reference, a number of kind of demands from the Sultan that the Ottomans cease to sell coffee to the Europeans, right? And so they, you know, you have all of these kinds of um, uh, interests of the Ottoman Sultan trying to, to intervene in Yemen, even though he clearly had no jurisdiction over the area. And so that became, that was an issue that um, comes up in the sources in the early 18th century. Many envoys were sent down to try to, to kind of, to, to, to intervene in, the, in, in that, um, in European sales. They were always a complete failure. They never were able to get the imam to compel the imam to really stop them. Although he did, you know, there are a few times where he 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 said, you know, you know, you're not going to be able to buy coffee. He tried to kind of, you know, mitigate their their presence in the market. But um, but so you know, so you have that very interesting kind of of of, of let's say desire of the Ottomans to get back in that role of having control over over coffee, although they were never successful. But of course, by the time they come back in the, into the 19th century, by that point, really the role that Yemen coffee is playing in the global market has had diminished to such a large extent. And of course, in the 19th century too, um, I am pretty, yeah, I, I think my, my dates are right. We you know, are eventually going to, to, to witness the discovery of coffea robusta, right? In different parts of Africa that are, uh, in a, you know, uh, coffee connoisseurs will tell you that robusta is, is undrinkable, but of course that then began to fuel the market in very different ways as well. So everything had changed by that point. Yes, yeah, thank you. This, this is from what, by a question in Washington, D.C. from the uh, owner of Alma. Oh, I Yes. Okay. Yes. And, we, and I, I did. I didn't make mention of the fact that, of course, now there are many um, uh, entrepreneurs who are trying to revive the Yemen coffee industry. And um, Anda Greeny, who I know is um, is one of them, as well as Mukhtar Al Khanshali, who some of you may know from the Monk of Mocha book. And and so this is uh, really a kind of interesting moment and a moment of, of change in that in well, that market. Well, uh, Anda's asking: uh, Are you seeing growing academic interest in researching Mocha and Yemen's coffee to correspond with a growing interest in drinking Yemen's coffee? Uh, yeah. And part two is um, primary sources mostly written by Western observers. Are secondary sources also mostly written by Western scholars, English, French, German, Dutch, or are there more important secondary sources in Arabic or Turkish? Yes, um, yeah, okay. So yeah. Western central due to language of secondary mm -hmm. sources. 
Yeah, you know, great, great questions. And so um, in terms of academic research, yes, I think there's a lot of interest in coffee and also coffee outside of Yemen, um, you know, this kind of early well, I mean, I would say that there's always been a great deal of coffee kind of globally, and there's a lot of writing that I, you know, I sometimes kind of bristle at because, you know, it kind of picks up coffee in the 17th century in Europe as if that was like the beginning of coffee story, which we all know is not at all the case and kind of glosses over these early roots of coffee. Um, but I think that, that there is more interest academically, but there's also more interest on the popular sense, right? And so you have lots of popular accounts that are kind of repeating what I've described to you about the story of Ashatha as the single, singular originator and so forth. Um, and so they kind of run parallel to each other. Um, and there's not a lot of overlap sometimes, which is quite interesting. And so, you know, I sometimes get a little bit blue in the face. I, I think I've stopped, you know, by kind of trying to bring forward some of the sources that really um, maybe add some dimension to some of the popular accounts, again, while understanding what the value of those accounts are. Um, and I would say in terms of um, secondary sources um, uh, in um, Arabic and Turkish, I know there's a lot more local interest that I've seen lately, but it's very interesting because even when we're, you're looking at studies um, on um, uh, Yemeni history in the 17th century, Yemeni historians are, are you know, using translated sources from European languages. I mean, in addition to obviously local Arabic sources, I mean, there is an understanding that in this moment, because of this influx of European presence, presence and documentation, that those are really valuable sources. So I think there is an understanding among Yemeni historians that there, you know, that one can benefit from these European materials and they provide a very different perspective. Again, to go back to Case Brouwer, the very um, well-known Dutch historian, he and one of his collaborators a few years ago, I was very Press, they, they translated a large number of early Dutch sources into Arabic, right? And, and that was really important um, work to be done because, um, you know, those are not only archival sources, but obviously Dutch is not as um, widespread of a language as some of, you know, as either English or French, where which um, is the language of most of the other sources. Um, and Niebuhr published in both German um, and, and French, so. I think just two quick final questions. I think it's clear that coffee was roasted before drinking in Yemen in early days, I've been served a hot drink uh, brewed from green and roasted beans in northern Saada region, uh, I think toward the Akupa. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. There, there's the the unroasted beans. There's a kishir, and then there's a coffee yeah. brewed from beans. I will say, you know what? My husband is a culinary culinary studies person, so I would leave that to him. I don't want to get too deep into things that I'm unqualified to talk about. But indeed, I okay. understand there's many different versions on the peninsula of coffee consumption that are not widespread at all outside of the peninsula. Right. Final question. It's from uh, Francine Stern. It's lovely to see you after appreciating your work. May I ask you one small question about the rosewater sprinkler like that collected by Nibar? Yes, I think Francine wants to speak. Can someone allow Francine to, to just ask her question? Yeah, I can do that now. One second, please. Francine, you're able to talk now if you'd like to ask your question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, bless you. I, I can't manage all this um, technology. So thank you, whoever gave me voice. Um, I, I, I'm really curious um, about the, um, the rosewater sprinkler. Um, that's clearly not Yemeni. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm curious to know what connection it had to the women's life in the period. Yeah, that's a great question, Francine. First of all, hello, nice to hear from you. Good to see that you're, you know, I, I'm always, you know, reconnecting with people after the pandemic, you know, it's, it's always nice to know that, that uh, to, or to hear voices and uh, sometimes to see faces as well. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I do have an article on this where I kind of got into the many um, practices around coffee that were a major part of merchant interactions. And so actually, I do not, this, that rosewater sprinkler, um, it was something that Niebuhr, uh, you know, he saw, um, uh, you know, and he recorded from his experiences. And, you know, there were really elaborate um, engagements whenever you were going to start a transaction, right? You know, you came in and there was rosewater, you had a kishur, um, there was the, uh, you know, sm uh, smoking of the of the uh, the pipe, as well as uh, the nargila, as well as, of course, um, the burning of, uh, of incense, right? And so, 
he all of those those five things I showed you at the end those were all taken from from Niebuhr's account of you know the of the nature of those particular ceremonies that were very male oriented right I mean we're when we're talking about the merchant world we're really really talking about a you know kind of a male sphere and um and what was amazing about that that image is I've looked at it for many years and then I realized oh yes we can actually we you know all of these are things that are in our orbit um, and it was very clear that that was a Qing dynasty, you know, uh, uh, a porcelain vessel um, that was often, and they were often fitted with like metal metal fittings um, outside of China, sometimes in the Middle East, sometimes in Iran en route. Um, and so we, you know, kind of had these objects that definitely come from the East, but they don't have a single point of origin. So um, I, there are many, many of those actually, lots in the VNA, really, really beautiful examples. And what I love about that Niebuhr image is, is that it, you know, we know they were circulating around, but it really locates that type of thing in Yemen at that time. And that's like really, really exciting, um, along with some of those other objects that um, that are kind of more characteristically Yemeni in character. And I just want to say one thing I know James is, is going to bring us to a close in a moment, but that in fact, what I see is it's actually a kind of combination of both local objects like that very rustic coffee pot, that very rustic incense burner that you saw with these highly uh, refined objects that have come from outside that um, you know form this real ethos of coffee culture in Yemen that I think was quite unique in the 18th century. So. Well, just as I say, thank you for my part. That's fascinating. Thank you for answering all those questions. But I'm going to hand over to James now, who's going to. Uh, well, thank well, you, thank you, Noel. And thank you, Nancy. My goodness, that was an absolutely fascinating talk. And I think has filled in so many gaps in our, our understanding, especially those of us who've had the chance to visit Mocha and just wondering about how it all happened and so on. So thank you. Thank you for that. I just to pick up that comment I was making um, while Noah was finding his his, his video button, um, I, I think many in the audience would have visited certainly uh, Yemen in, and Mocha in the in the nineteen seventies, and obviously the thing to photograph was the mosques and the and the, and the trading houses as they disintegrated into the sand. So uh, I, I'm now motivated to go and dig around in my attic and, and find those ancient slides. Um, and I can Please remember, share if you do. I would love to well, see them. Thank you. I will send them to you then. I can remember in 2013, just after the Arab Spring, when I was working in Thais, I can remember begging the, the Thais governor, for goodness sake, do some basic re um, renovation and reconstruction or the buildings would be totally lost. Um, and, and as you say, things have happened since then. Um, just a comment about the revival of Yemeni coffee. As we were talking, um, because uh, I know that uh, Haraz in particular, they've been sort of pioneering actually the removal of gut trees and replanting of, of, of coffee is quite something. Um, but as we were talking during this session, I had a, a note from a friend of mine who who follows ship movements. So uh, current ship movements, unlike your, <laughs> your interest a few centuries back. And he told me there was a recent shipment of Jaime coffee into Oman of 4,000 kilograms. So that's quite, a, quite substantial. Yes. Um, and then just look at a final comment, because you did mention the destruction of Yemeni heritage during your mm -hmm. your, your early remarks in your talk. Uh, and we plan some point next year to really start looking into that in a bit more detail. And right. I think it's horrendous what's happened, um, not just in Mocha, but elsewhere. Uh, and also the, the looting of items from museums. I, I read to my horror that um, I think only last week there were Yemeni yeah, items appearing in auction houses in, in London. I mean, it's just, you know, this thing must be must be stopped and looked into. Um, so look, it just re reminds me to, to thank you again. Uh, it's been a really fascinating evening. Um, please, if you are, uh, if you haven't joined yet the British uh, British Yemeni Society, please do so. We hope these you find these talks uh, of great interest. And thank you, Nancy and Noel, for for all your contributions this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.